it looked like just another stretch of California's spectacular coastline. Then, without warning, hundreds of meters of cliff vanished in minutes, swallowing homes and highways. Investigators uncovered soil layers and voids that match no previous survey. That discovery raises the stakes for thousands now facing urgent evacuation. How did a well-monitored coastline fail so catastrophically? And what have experts discovered in the aftermath that changes everything we thought we knew? Field teams arrived on the battered coastline before sunrise, hauling ground-penetrating radar units and reinforced sampling kits across the slick, unstable bluff. Every step was logged. Each scan plotted along a pre-drawn grid stretching from the cliff's new edge back toward the nearest homes. Operators calibrated the radar to penetrate up to 12 meters, adjusting frequency settings to account for dense, saturated soils. As the first passes began, a steady stream of time-stamped readings fed into encrypted tablets, creating a digital chain that tracked every data point from collection to analysis. Lab technicians set up a mobile intake station just beyond the evacuation barriers. Samples were sealed, labeled, and entered into a custody log. Each entry recorded the precise location, depth, and time of extraction, ensuring no mix-ups or contamination. Instruments were checked against calibration standards before and after every run, with any irregularities flagged for review. Back in the temporary lab, the lead technician reviewed the intake sheets. The process was methodical, soil cores split, moisture content measured, mineral layers cataloged. Every step followed strict protocols with two-person verification for each handoff. As the hours passed, the evidence chain grew. Radar grids, lab codes, custody signatures, all building a record designed to withstand scrutiny. By midday, the investigation had produced a map of the subsurface, a catalog of physical samples, and a custody log that traced every artifact from field to bench. The team's work established a foundation of trust in the evidence, setting the stage for the next phase, interpreting what the data revealed about the unseen forces beneath California's coastline. Dr. Lena Ortiz stood over the digital subsurface map tracing her finger along a jagged band that cut 60 meters inland from the bluff's edge. The radar data revealed something no one had predicted, a series of elongated cavities, some as close as eight meters below the surface, stretching beneath the ground where homes and roads still stood. These voids were not narrow cracks or simple water channels. They formed irregular pockets, some large enough to swallow a car, clustered in patterns that defied the standard models for coastal erosion. Soil samples pulled from these areas told a story that did not match any previous survey. The uppermost layers, expected to show compacted marine clay and sand in clear sequence, were instead interrupted by loose, unconsolidated fill and scattered fragments of rock that seemed out of place. In some cores, the mineral composition shifted abruptly with bands of silt and gravel sandwiched between strata where only clay should have been. Dr. Ortiz compared these findings to the last comprehensive survey, completed just eight months earlier. The differences were stark, entire layers missing or rearranged, as if the ground beneath the cliff had been hollowed out and then crudely patched. The geometry of the voids raised new questions. Instead of forming along predictable fault lines or following the slope's natural drainage, the cavities twisted and branched, sometimes running parallel to the coast, sometimes veering inland beneath residential streets. In several locations, the radar picked up faint echoes of water, suggesting that hidden channels might still be moving beneath the surface. Further weakening the ground above, Dr. Ortiz's provisional conclusion was clear the collapse could not be explained by surface erosion alone. The physical evidence pointed to a deeper, more complex failure, one that left the stability of the remaining coastline in doubt. With the map now marked in red, she notified emergency management that the risk extended far beyond the original collapse zone. At 11.42 in the morning, 
the county's emergency operations center issued a formal evacuation order for the neighborhoods closest to the mapped voids. The directive covered a corridor stretching from the bluff's edge back to the main highway, encompassing 3,200 residents. Notification protocols moved into effect. Automated calls activated in English and Spanish, text alerts pinged registered phones, and digital road signs flashed evacuation codes along arterial routes. Printed notices, preloaded with QR codes for shelter locations, were distributed door to door by uniformed deputies with body cameras recording each delivery. The decision matrix behind the order relied on updated risk models from the geotechnical team. Any home sitting above a radar identified cavity or within a 20 meter buffer was classified as high risk. Addresses flagged for immediate evacuation were cross-referenced with utility records to ensure no one was missed. The emergency manager speaking from the command desk described a strict chain of command. Field engineers relayed findings to the operations chief who briefed county leadership before the order was signed and time-stamped. Three shelters opened within the hour, two at local schools and one at a civic center, each listed in the official notice. Transportation for those without vehicles was coordinated through the county's paratransit service with dispatch logs documenting every trip. Law enforcement maintained a rolling perimeter, updating access points as new data arrived from the field. The entire process, from risk confirmation to the last notification sent, was logged in the incident management system. By late afternoon, the evacuation zone was cleared and the emergency manager's team began the next phase, securing the area for further investigation. Lila Hernandez stood on the sidewalk, clutching a plastic bag filled with medication and a faded envelope that held her insurance paperwork. Just hours before, she had been inside her home watching the news tickers flash warnings. The ground beneath her feet still steady. Now her kitchen window looked out over an empty lot where her neighbor's house had vanished overnight. The evacuation order had been clear. Leave now, take only what you can carry. Lila's car was blocked by debris, so she joined a line of residents heading toward the school gymnasium, each step away from the bluff edge heavy with uncertainty and the weight of evacuation. By dusk, the shelter buzzed with the low hum of conversation and the clatter of cots being unfolded. Volunteers from the local fire auxiliary handed out bottled water and blankets, their red vests bright against the gray of the storm. A sign-up sheet for assistance filled quickly, and by the end of the first evening, more than 100 families had registered for temporary housing. A volunteer named Marcus, who lived one mile inland, organized a network of drivers to shuttle people from the evacuation zone to the shelter, logging each trip to make sure no one was left behind. For many, the loss was still sinking in. Lila's property insurance claim joined a growing stack. And by the following week, the county reported over 300 claims filed. Some residents, unable to return, relied on neighbors and strangers alike for updates and support. In the face of sudden displacement, the community's response became its own kind of lifeline, binding together people who just days before had been strangers, living side by side. A stack of permit amendments, stamped and initialed by city planners, sits at the center of the investigation. One document stands out, a drainage modification approved in June 2024, authorizing a reroute of stormwater runoff near the bluff's edge. The signature at the bottom belongs to a senior engineer who, according to internal emails, questioned the volume calculations but received no reply before the permit was finalized. Funding records show the project was fast-tracked after a state grant arrived that summer. It was part of an effort to address the region's mounting infrastructure backlog, and by then over $1 billion in deferred repairs had accumulated along the coast. Among the files is a memo from Dr. Lena Ortiz, dated August 2024. In it, she urges the planning department to commission updated subsurface surveys before construction begins, citing recent anomalies in groundwater flow and soil density. Her recommendation is clear. 
No further development until full geotechnical review is complete. The memo is marked as received, but never appears in the project's approval log. When questioned later, Dr. Ortiz describes a sense of urgency that went unanswered. She recalls raising her concerns in person at a staff meeting, only to be told that budget constraints left little room for additional studies. The paper trail paints a picture of foreknowledge and missed opportunities. Official records confirm that warnings about subsurface instability were documented months before the collapse, yet no new surveys were ordered. The permits moved forward, the funding was spent, and the ground beneath the coastline remained unexamined until it was too late. Highway 1, the backbone of coastal travel in California, now runs perilously close to ground flagged as unstable. Just south of Davenport, a segment serving more than 10,000 vehicles each day sits above a bluff where recent scans revealed elongated voids less than 10 meters beneath the asphalt. Engineers from Caltrans, led by regional supervisor Mark Saito, reviewed the latest hazard maps and issued a warning. Any further collapse here would sever the only direct route between Santa Cruz and the northern coast, isolating entire communities and cutting off emergency access. A few miles inland, a main feeder line for the regional power grid snakes across the hillside, supported by towers anchored in soil, now mapped as high risk. According to public works records, this line supplies electricity to over 40,000 homes and businesses, from Santa Cruz to Bonnie Dune. The consequences of a tower failure, especially during storm season, would ripple across hospitals, schools, and water pumping stations, compounding the crisis. Closer to the city, the Westside Water Treatment Facility processes millions of gallons each week for Santa Cruz and neighboring towns. The plant's outflow pipes run beneath a stretch of ground where ground-penetrating radar detected irregular cavities and saturated fill. If these pipes rupture or the bluff gives way, thousands could lose access to clean water and raw sewage could spill into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Mark Saito's team cataloged each threat, cross-referencing infrastructure grids with the geotechnical survey. The resulting map outlined not just immediate danger, but a chain reaction of failures that could unfold if the coastline continues to destabilize. Each red zone on the map represents more than a line on paper. It is a lifeline for entire communities now hanging in the balance. Across the state, Team Saath Saas, teams compiled the latest subsurface data into a single sprawling map. Each flagged segment appeared as a streak of red or orange, stretching from Mendocino in the north, past the battered bluffs of Santa Cruz, and down to the cliffs above Monterey Bay. The digital overlays revealed a patchwork of risk zones, some small and isolated, others forming wide corridors that paralleled the coastline for hundreds of meters at a time. These signatures did not just cluster around the original collapse, Instead, they dotted the shoreline at regular intervals, highlighting areas where ground-penetrating radar had picked up similar voids, water-saturated layers, or abrupt changes in soil density. In Santa Cruz County alone, five additional sections were flagged for immediate review. Farther south, near Big Sur, the map displayed a ribbon of instability running beneath a stretch of Highway 1, that had already endured months of closures and emergency repairs. Caltrans field notes from January listed more than a dozen sites statewide where cracks, slumping, or unexplained subsidence had been documented within the past six weeks. Each entry corresponded to a cluster on the risk map, confirming that the problem was not confined to a single community or county. The mapping process drew on years of archived surveys, but the new data forced a recalibration of what was considered stable ground. In places where the last official assessment showed only minor erosion, radar now detected cavities up to 10 meters below the surface, enough to threaten roads, pipelines, and entire neighborhoods. Engineers layered recent storm reports and tide gauge records onto the map, 
searching for patterns that might explain the sudden expansion of risk. Where the overlays matched, the team prioritized further investigation. Where they diverged, the uncertainty deepened. By the end of the day, the composite map was shared with emergency managers, utility operators, and county planners from Mendocino to Monterey. What began as a local crisis now spanned more than a hundred miles of coastline. With each new data point raising the stakes for communities perched above the Pacific, the scale of the threat was no longer theoretical. It was visible in every colored band and flagged coordinate, a living record of a coastline under siege. Emergency managers and engineers met behind closed doors to draft the first round of action steps. The new risk map left no room for delay. Within hours, a countywide directive ordered the deployment of additional ground sensors, including accelerometers, tilt meters, and groundwater probes to every flagged segment along the bluffs. Installation crews worked in staggered shifts, drilling sensor arrays into the most vulnerable zones. Each unit streamed real-time data to the regional operations center, where analysts monitored for signs of soil movement or sudden shifts in water pressure. Survey teams expanded their grid, extending transects beyond the original collapse site to cover all high-priority corridors. Drone flights mapped fresh cracks and slumps, while field geologists logged every new fissure with GPS coordinates. The county's Public Works Department launched an accelerated review of all pending construction permits within the risk corridor. Effective immediately, a moratorium halted new development and major renovations on parcels within 100 meters of any mapped void or instability zone. Local officials called for an independent review commission, drawing on outside geotechnical experts and representatives from the State Geological Survey. The commission's mandate was to audit the chain of decisions leading up to the collapse, verify the accuracy of all survey data, and recommend permanent changes to land use policy. Residents received a checklist outlining steps to monitor their own properties for warning signs, cracks in foundations, changes in drainage, and unexplained shifts in doors or windows. A dedicated hotline open to receive field reports and to route urgent cases to engineering inspectors. Utility companies began inspecting pipelines and power lines that crossed flagged areas preparing contingency plans for rapid shutoff if further ground movement was detected. The first week closed with a public briefing. Officials outlined the expanded sensor grid, the permit moratorium, and the formation of the review commission. They promised transparency, daily updates, and a commitment to act on new findings as soon as they arrived. For the thousands living along California's threatened coastline, the message was clear. Vigilance and rapid response had become the new standard. Right now, California's cliffs are disappearing faster than science can explain or policy can protect. As storms intensify and infrastructure ages, the line between coast and crisis blurs. Every inch lost is not just land. It is stability, memory, and warning. What happens next will depend on choices made today not geological time. Let me know what you think in the comments below.